We're going to be covering all of the ethical, legislative and animal welfare issues associated with international work because it's a massive subject. But hopefully I'll give you a flavour. Um, some of this presentation might be a bit sentimental in parts. I'm not going to apologise for that. I think as vets we're often not very connected with um, emotions in terms of animal welfare and I think that's probably something we ought to pay a bit more attention to. So Mike has already given you a really good overview of the differences between animal welfare science, ethics and law. So I'm not going to go into that in any major detail. But I do think it's important when we're working overseas that we have an appreciation of where we've come from. And I know that obviously that not everyone sitting in the room is from the UK. I totally appreciate that. Uh, so this will be different for, for all of us. Um, I do a lot of work internationally. And the thing that I've learned through working in, uh, with other countries and people from different cultures is that the UK is a really, really weird place when it comes to animal welfare. Anything about this timeline that stands out to you as being perhaps a bit unusual in terms of priorities? How before children. Yeah. <laughs> Weird, isn't it? Yeah, so, uh, but that's, that's basically um, how, how the UK legislation development has, has worked. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, James, but I believe that the NSPCC, the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, was actually set up by the RSPCA because they were sick and tired of people phoning, well, not phoning them, it was before the telephones, but writing to them, I expect, to complain about the fact that children were being abused. So we had the RSPCA for a considerable number of years before we had any kind of similar organisation for child protection. It was a slightly higher motivation than... Well, probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's weird, isn't it? I mean, I think we can all agree, in terms of priorities, that is weird. And so I think when we are from the UK, I'm from the UK, uh, and we go overseas in our post-colonial attitude to tell other people how they should be treating their animals, um, it's really important that we recognise that our frame of reference is actually quite bizarre and that probably a lot of other countries have a slightly more pragmatic and reasonable approach to their priorities and that's something that we should probably pay attention to. Um, as Mike has said, ethics influence legislation and that improvements to animal welfare policy are usually based on scientific evidence, but it's unlikely that evidence alone would result in improved welfare unless it resonates with prevailing public attitudes and values. And so to improve welfare, it's all about that public opinion. It's about what we as a society deem to be ethically appropriate. And what is ethically appropriate within society will vary from country to country. So I talked about the definition of animals earlier. In the United States, if you're a rodent, you're not an animal. If you're a bird, you're not an animal. If you're a reptile or anything non-mammalian, you're not an animal. You have zero protection under the Animal Welfare Act. I find that bonkers, but it is what it is. So how do we make these decisions? What is okay and not okay? I do a lot of work, as I said, in, in a variety of different countries. To most of us from the UK, this is totally unacceptable. These are dogs being transported for the meat trade. This is a dog that's been slaughtered for the meat trade. It's a pig being transported for the meat trade. Pig being slaughtered. This is okay. This is not. Is that a reasonable line to draw? What's that based on? Do you think the pig cares any less about the outcome for its own welfare or its own life experience than the dogs do? From the animal's perspective, those two situations aren't really any different. The pigs aren't lining up at the slaughterhouse. They're not, you know, waiting at the bus stop for the truck to come along and take them. Um, but we get a lot more upset. We have a much more visceral, emotional reaction to things like dog meat trade than to the use of, of pigs for, for meat. Because one is societally acceptable and the other one isn't. So when we talk about welfare, I think it's really important that we do focus on the experience of the animal. Because our values, our morals, our judgments, our societal policy are, will all vary depending on our own viewpoint, our culture, our ethical analysis, whatever. But the animal's welfare is something that matters to that animal. It's something that is about that animal's experience. It doesn't depend on the economics. It doesn't depend on our ethical stance. It doesn't depend on culture or geographic region. It depends on the animal's experience on what we do to that animal. 
So the pig doesn't care that it's a pig, the dog doesn't care that it's a dog. They each care about their own experiences. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about welfare. So what's good animal welfare? Pet dog at home, sleeping on the bed, nice life, it's got a friend. Is that good animal welfare, do we think, in general? What about if the dog is a border collie or a husky that's home alone for eight hours a day because its owner's at work? It's not always good, is it? But we tend to generally think that the welfare of our pet dogs overall is all right. What about working dogs? Dogs that perhaps might spend quite a lot of their time in fairly barren environments. But then when they do get to work, if they're out retrieving or herding or doing the thing that they've been bred to do, does that balance out those periods of kind of inactivity? And is that okay? Is that, is that justifiable? The welfare okay? And then I see quite a lot of this. This is a street dog. It's quite a nice looking street dog. Um, what about the welfare of that animal? Is that acceptable? Is it okay to have free roaming dogs? Do we as a society think that that's acceptable? In the UK, we generally don't. Uh, and there are steps put in place to, to minimise that. In other countries, it's perfectly acceptable to have free roaming dogs on the streets. But is their welfare a problem simply because they're free roaming? Very much in the UK, we have quite a paternalistic attitude towards animals. So we tend to think that stray dogs or, or animals that are free roaming must automatically, their welfare must be compromised simply because we're not there to look after them. But that's not always the case. So we need to separate our own emotional responses from the welfare issues that those animals face. So how we judge or value an animal in society will depend on its category. Our pet dogs we value and cherish. Animals that we use for performance, for sport, for economic values are useful to us only because of what they, their extrinsic worth, what they can bring to us. And for animals that are a pest that might be diseased or, or might be a threat to us in terms of things like aggression or, or disease transfer, rabies, then we will judge those differently. So just like Mike said with his mice analogy, how we value animals in our society depends very much on their role. But their welfare or their welfare needs are the same in terms of the five welfare needs uh, that we, we think that they need. So the role of animals in society is influenced by us, by our attitudes, by our beliefs about what we think is valuable for those animals, what we think those animals need, and ways that we think it's appropriate to use those animals. And that is actually a very subjective um, opinion. And our societal culture is made up of lots of those subjective opinions. Sometimes, as Mike said, it can be based on scientific evidence and that can influence um, societal opinion. But quite often, it is, it's fairly subjective and it can be fairly irrational. We're much more likely to be empathetic towards animals that are phylogenetically closer to us, primates, chimpanzees. That's why, for example, it's illegal to test uh, on great apes across the EU. Why? Do they feel pain any more than a rabbit or a rodent? They have a greater capacity to suffer. Does in, is it intelligence equivalent to ability to suffer? Um, and how animals look also determines uh, our perceptions of them and, and their value in our society. So es essentially, animal welfare policy, animal welfare law around the world is determined by our beliefs. And our beliefs are fundamentally irrational. And that's why I think animal welfare science is really important, because we are just not very good at making decisions about how to treat animals in society or, or, or what we should do. It doesn't mean that we should shy away from that, but I think being aware of our own biases is really important, because if we can be aware of them, we can start to look for more objective evidence. And also, if we can understand the types of things that influence our decisions, I think that that's really useful, coming back to the, the theme of this presentation, which is about working overseas, is that we are often quite very influenced by our own cultural perceptions. And as soon as we move overseas and we live overseas, as some of you have come to the UK, you'll find that it is very different and there are different cultural priorities and different societal priorities. And if we can understand the things that motivate and drive how we make decisions, then we can start to understand why other people have different beliefs and why other cultures value animals differently. And if we can understand that, that makes for a more effective uh, working environment. So, 
I've been working overseas for about 10 years, and one of the reasons I really like international work is that it's a constant learning curve. Every day is a school day. I'm constantly learning things. I think one of the reasons that um, I've been uh, successful, if you can call it that, um, is because when I graduated, I didn't really have any interest in working overseas. I wanted to be a zoo vet, and I was a zoo vet for a while, and I got very disillusioned with that. So Romain has alluded to some of the challenges this morning. Um, but I also had a solid mixed practice background, so really good or solid, at least, general practice uh, medical and surgical skills. And that fundamentally would be my take-home message for this presentation, is that if you've got any interest in improving animal welfare or improving veterinary work overseas, make sure you have the skills and knowledge to do so. International work, particularly in developing countries, is not a place where you go to learn veterinary skills. You need to consolidate those skills before you go into a more challenging environment and, and try and, and deliver you know, good veterinary services. Preparation is really important. Make sure you know what kind of situation you might be going into. Um, think, consider things like drug availability. Um, consider things like your budget, if you have one. Um, any logistics relating to travel or veterinary licensing. I'll talk about some of those issues in a minute. Um, and then remember, as always, with everything, you are part of a team. So um, internationally, veterinary nurses often don't exist. But there are often other people there, so paravets or, or vet assistants, uh, dog catchers, or, or people who are involved in animal husbandry and handling. And a lot of those people will have often no education or training uh, from a, in a formal sense. Some of them may well be illiterate. But um, some of the most natural animal handling and some of the most impressive animal handling that I've ever encountered has come from people who can't read or write. So those things aren't necessarily, um, you know, education isn't everything. Sometimes experience and empathy can get you a long way. And obviously have some respect for whatever situation you might be going into. Do some reading. Make sure you know uh, some of the things that might have influenced a culture. Um, you know, have a, a think about some of the, the political issues that you might face or, or um, religion or, or economics. I was um, at a presentation a couple of years ago in, in Romania at a conference and I was watching a colleague give a presentation, it's from the United States, and he put up a, a slide of a TV show that used to be popular in the United States about, about 30 years ago. And I can't remember what context it was in, but he, he, was, he said to the audience of people in Romania, so um, did any of you used to watch this TV show as a kid? And I sat in the audience and went, oh, God. Does anyone know what's happening in Romania 20 to 30 years ago? Yeah, Ceausescu. Like, nobody had a TV. People were starving to death. They certainly weren't watching American cartoons on their non-existent TVs. And in that moment, he lost his audience. Because the, the whole of the audience just went, you don't know us. You don't know us. You don't know anything about us. And you're here trying to tell us about animal husbandry and how we should keep our animals. And yet, you don't know us. And I just saw the room switch off. So understand your audience, understand the type of situation that those people might have experienced and the challenges they may have experienced. So I'm asked this question quite a lot, how can I get involved? And um, this is where I become a bit negative. I apologize for that, it does improve. Um, but my first question would be, what can you contribute? It's great that as veterinary students you have enthusiasm and I absolutely would not want to undermine that. But in general, you are very inexperienced. You're not going to be surgically competent or medically competent. And it's very, very easy as a veterinary student to get yourself, or as a new graduate vet, to get yourself into a situation where you don't have the skills or the knowledge or the expertise to cope with that situation. And that can be incredibly psychologi psychologically challenging for you. Uh, and it can also obviously impact on animal welfare. What's your motivation? Do you want to go and work in a spay neuter project in Eastern Europe or Asia because you want to practice loads of surgery on animals? And the ones that are out there are less sentient than the ones in the UK? Because they're not. And if you think that gaining surgical skills by performing surgeries in a less supervised environment with less access to anesthetics and analgesics is an ethically reasonable decision to make, doesn't that undermine that oath that you're just about to swear in a couple of years when you graduate? Because it's not just about the animals in the UK, it's about all of the animals that you'll interact with. How emotionally resilient are you? Even if you are well prepared and have good intentions, you might see things which you find really distressing. 
taken a couple of colleagues out to Asia um, recently. I keep mentioning Asia just because it's the area where I, I do a lot of work. Um, I'm not going to get country specific, but I've had colleagues that are very experienced and have travelled quite a lot, and still, after years in practice and, and good um, surgical and medical skills, still been challenged in terms of their ability to be able to deal with the challenges that they're faced with. Do you have the necessary skills and attitude? And kind of coming back to your motivation, is it about you feeling good, or is it about you actually doing good? And there is a difference, and I think a little bit of that self-auditing, a bit like what Romain was saying this morning in terms of surgical outcomes, it's not just about going out there and delivering your, your knowledge or your expertise. It's about actually what's the outcome. What's the outcome for the communities you're working with? What's, what are the outcomes for the animals that you're working with? And are they having a good welfare experience? So, uh, I do have some experience to back up uh, the pontification. And uh, this is one of them. These are African wild dogs, free roaming in Zimbabwe. Um, when I was at vet school, I used to be in the same year as James. In order to escape that, I had to intercalate, so I went to Liverpool for a year. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Liverpool for a year and did conservation medicine. It was a nice year off, 12 hours of lectures a week. It's basically a holiday. And then, um, because I wanted to be a zebra, I decided I'd go and get some field work experience. I went to Zimbabwe and did some field research on uh, African wild dogs. And uh, while I was out there, we were following the dogs one morning. And one of them was behaving a little bit oddly. So we darted it. Uh, I was a third, so I'd just finished my third year at Bristol and then intercalated for a year at Liverpool. So I'd done you know, very little EMS over my intercalated year as well. And I'd only been a third year vet student, so I didn't really know anything. This uh, I took this photograph, and just after I took it, Peter, who's this guy here, turned around and looked at me and went, so what do you want to do now with this dog, this anaesthetized, critically endangered carnivore that I've just anaesthetized so that you can tell me what's wrong with it? Third year vet student. No idea. No idea, obviously. So I was out there with a friend. This is Kieran. He now teaches cardiology at the, um, at the RBC. And... Um, we decided this dog was an size. We'd give it some fluids, we'd give it some antibiotics, because that fixes everything. Um, and uh, we'd fortunately had a, a sort of uh, a, an enclosure area, so we took it. We thought we'd just monitor it, because um, that was about the level of our expertise. So that's what we did. And uh, as it was recovering from its anaesthetic, this critically endangered carnivore had a massive seizure and died. So that was nice. Uh, the reason you can't see any of its teeth on the, the side that it's, it's dependent side is because it chewed them all, broke them all off, broke all its molars off, chewing onto a, a, card, um, a concrete curb. And the reason this leg looks a bit odd is because it's broken. It fractured its humerus as well. So it seizured so violently that it managed to break its teeth and, it, and its leg. So, so what do you do in that situation? What are your next steps? Post-mortem, thanks, Emma. Yeah, so we thought we'd do that, post-mortem, because we knew what we were looking for. <laughs> this is not how you post-mortem an endangered carnivore. Um, we did have the species survival plan, which did have a really detailed post-mortem guide, so we read that, and we literally read that and then did it. Anything wrong with this photo? Anything ringing any alarm bells for anyone? It's all right, shut up. I, am, I know that this is a shit show. You do not need to tell me that this is a disaster. <laughs> infectious disease. What kind of infectious diseases do you think might be infecting this endangered carnivore that's just exhibited neurological signs and then seizured <laughs> in sub-Saharan Africa? <laughs> right, good, well done. So what's wrong with this photo? There's blood freaking everywhere. There's blood, there's bodily fluids, there's everything. We, um, we sampled its brain with a drinking straw, because that's what it said in the species survival plan. I kid you not. Wearing those gloves. And also, what you can't see in this photograph is that the day before, uh, we'd been out uh, patrolling for snares. It's really thorny in Africa. Um, wearing not, you know, shorts and stuff, because that's what white people wear when they go overseas. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was covered. I was covered in scratches. I'd got scratches that were less than 24 hours old all over my arms, because we'd been going, you know, going through thorn, acacia trees, acacia bushes, pulling out snares to, you know, contribute to the world. And uh, loads of open wounds. Those uh, vinyl gloves, I don't even think they were laser, vinyl gloves were massively friable because I think they'd been sitting in an office in Zimbabwe for about 10 years. So we got through about 500 pairs of those in the post-mortem because they kept breaking. 
it never occurred to us that dog died of rabies because up until that point there had never been a case of rabies in an African wild dog in Zimbabwe. So I have the dubious honour of being the first person to uh, diagnose that as a third year vet student. Uh, and then Kieran and I had to order in some rabies vaccine from Harare, get that flown down, drank quite a bit of gin, and then injected each other. So that's... <laughs> it's the end of my summer holiday. Went back to Bristol where I entered fourth year and we had the worst infectious disease lectures which showed photos of, of, of people dying horribly of rabies. And uh, I was a nervous wreck for the next six months. So don't do that. It's really easy when you're enthusiastic and you want to contribute, change the world conservation and welfare, it's all really positive, to get yourself well out of your depth. So um, I have some experience. These are some photos of colleagues of mine who went on a new grad spay neuter program in Romania because their dogs don't feel anything. You can practice your surgical skills on them all you like. Um, you get loads of blood-borne parasites outside of the UK. We tend not to get Babesia and Leishmania and all those kinds of things here so much. Um, although they are increasing, obviously. But uh, internationally, when you do a bitch spay, they bleed a lot, a lot more than UK dogs do. It's really challenging as a new grad. I think there was a group of about 15 vet students doing this, doing their own anaesthetic monitoring and spaying. There was one vet who was supervising all of them. It was going on multiple times. Didn't, everyone came back from this holiday really stressed, anxious, and terrified about starting in practice because they felt totally incompetent out of their depth. They're also faced with trauma and other cases that, that arrived that they just didn't feel that they could cope with. There's a two, two of the guys from my year. One of them said to me afterwards, he said, we just went and bathed puppies for mange because that's what we felt we could do to make a difference. Like, they became so reluctant to engage with the clinical work because it was too overwhelming and too frightening and they felt so out of their depth and so unsupported that they just started bathing puppies which is fair enough, know, know your limits. But it's, you know, it's, it is psychologically quite challenging. Another friend of mine went out to um, an equine, a large equine charity. Uh, euthanasia was very controversial in the area that they were in. This was a horse that was carrying straw. The straw caught fire. This horse had, yeah, full, so it's not sedated in that photo. Uh, this horse has full thickness burns over the majority of its body can't be euthanized. It's the kind of stuff that gives you nightmares. Uh, this is a donkey that was bitten by a rabid dog. Can't be euthanized. This is a horse that had a penetrating injury to its globe, so it's having uh, an enucleation surgery under local anesthetic only. Major welfare animal welfare charity, new graduate experience. So you, it's really easy to get yourself in a situation where you feel helpless, you feel powerless, you feel like you can't make a difference, and that is really stressful. So preparation is useful, having good medical and surgical skills before you have to face those kind of things, because if you have to face those kinds of things, you need some experience, you need some knowledge, you need some skills to be able to say, actually, I know a better way of doing this, can I intervene, you know, let me show you. Be aware of veterinary licensing, that's where the legal thing come, side comes in. Um, if a vet from a developing country rocked up in the UK and started practicing, would that be okay? But weirdly, it's all right for us to do it when we're on our veterinary tourism holidays, isn't it? To turn up in another country, won't even bother to check if there's a veterinary licensing act or any kind of legislation, or if we need to, you know, do any of that legal stuff. Yeah, you do. You do. And lots of countries do have Veterinary Surgeons Acts, particularly uh, countries within the, the Commonwealth, they do. Um, and if you break the law overseas, if you're RCVS registered, you're still liable for that in the UK. So you can, it can affect your license in the UK. So it's worthwhile being aware of that. Drug access and availability internationally can be very variable. The level of veterinary education can also be very variable. What we consider to be a vet is not necessarily universal. Countries like China have only had a veterinary licensing exam since 2010. Historically, there's been very little distinction between somebody with a basic agricultural sciences degree and a vet. They've all been considered on the same spectrum. And so having that kind of level of professionalism, the practical skills relating to surgery and medicine, 
um, they're not always there. So we're all familiar with the oath, and it also exists in other countries around the world. So in a review, WSA did a review of, of different veterinary oaths, and out of 15 of them, eight of them mentioned animal welfare, nine mentioned the relief of suffering, two only, only two mentioned the relief of pain, and 12 mentioned ethics. So you would think that vets around the world are kind of working on the same page towards the same kinds of goals. But in practice, that doesn't necessarily translate. So things like this are really common. Qualified vets that are... Um, this is a covert filming. Um, I'll let you uh, play spot the, spot the error. Yeah, everyone, spot the error. If you didn't... Yeah, all right, good. Sterile surgery. Lack of appropriate anaesthetic monitoring, this is really common, even in animal welfare projects. We see these things repeatedly. Some of you might have seen this before. What's the problem here? This is a, a post-operative animal, if anybody needs some context for it. Yeah, so post-surgical pain, not being recognized, not being assessed. Those are the kinds of things we see routinely, even in projects run by animal welfare organizations or funded by animal welfare organizations. Often it's due to uh, a lack of veterinary training or awareness or a lack of uh, paraprofessional training or awareness on the ground. So we can't always assume that there are the veterinary skills out there to be able to deliver good animal welfare. Um, and in the, the lack of uh, veterinary skills and our lack of ability to influence those, particularly students or new grads, can be very emotionally challenging. Um, I got uh, Jess to have a look at some of these photos before they put, put them in because I didn't want to you know, be too negative, but after Paula's talk, I'm feeling like this is almost a happy place. Um, but, um, you know, the intentions are good. You know, let's pin this dog down for x-rays. that have been hit by a bus, by the way. Um, yeah, look at its leg. It's awesome, isn't it? This one, this has been treated by a vet. Look, it's got a bandage on it. So that's fine. <laughs> Veterinary treatment. Um, stray dogs that nobody cares about are really common. This is a friend of mine who sent me this the other week. She's not a vet, but uh, she's very sensible. She sent it to me and said, what do you think about this cat? Uh, it's a stray cat. It's still eating. Uh, but I'm really worried. Uh, there are loads of stray cats. It's in the Middle East. Loads of stray cats around here. Nobody really wants it. Um, I'm really worried about its eye being painful. Um, what, what do you think we should do with it? And uh, I looked at it and said, oh, I think that's got a ruptured globe, which will be very painful for it needs either medical treatment or, or euthanasia, no money for medical treatment. So it was euthanized and they cleaned it up and actually the globe was massively ruptured underneath. But um, it was pretty miserable. And they were found other things after they sedated it. But making decisions often with very limited diagnostics and often with animals if they're not um, used to human contact, they might be difficult to handle. Um, you know. It's really challenging, and as a new grad, to put yourself in situations where you might have to deal with clinical decision-making around these kinds of cases, it's, um, it's a difficult situation to be in. Even good intentions can lead to um, inadvertent consequences. This was something I was dealing with quite recently. Um, so I've been doing some work in Sri Lanka, colleagues in Sri Lanka at the Sri Lankan Veterinary Council, because they have that, along with the Veterinary Surgeons Act in Sri Lanka, which legally sets down who can and can't practice veterinary medicine in Sri Lanka, have been a bit upset with, unfortunately, British vets going into Sri Lanka and practicing without registering with the Sri Lankan Veterinary Council uh, and therefore essentially breaking the law. And um, that has created problems for other animal welfare organizations who are working in Sri Lanka in a legal capacity. So um, good intentions can still create uncomfortable outcomes, not just for the people involved, but also for the wider profession. So it's worthwhile being aware of that. So things that are challenges overseas, things like euthanasia. What kinds of, of problems do you think we can face in terms of euthanasia? Religious problems. Religious. Sometimes, yep. Anything else? Cultural expectations, yep. Availability of drugs, I'd say that that's probably more prevalent. We often, quite often, we focus on things like religion and culture. Having worked overseas for a bit, I'm less um, concerned about those as, as sweeping statements because I find religion and culture are actually very personal. 
So you'll often have this thing about, um, people often say, oh, you can't euthanize animals in India because Hinduism. There are loads of vets that, that euthanize animals in India that are Hindus. It's not a religious objection. Quite often it's a cultural concern because of drug availability and reputational risk is a massive thing to a lot of vets in India. Because if they're seen to be euthanizing an animal, even if it's obviously suffering, they're being seen often to not try. They're failing as vets because they haven't fixed it. And that can often create backlash and mistrust within the community. So often the things that we, cons we consider to be challenges for vets overseas aren't necessarily the same as, as what the real reality is. Things like amputation surgeries uh, for road traffic accidents, um, they can often be seen as a mutilation rather than helping an animal. And so quite often amputations are performed low down to minimize the harm of the mutilation rather than up at the, the top of the limb to prevent an animal then walk, you know, trying to walk on its stump. So inappropriate um, amputations can create further problems. And that's often a veterinary training problem. And we see loads of problems relating to anesthesia and analgesia just because of poor veterinary training. Often we're relying only on injectables from an anesthetic point of view. There can be some attitudes towards the use of, of things like um, analgesics. Um, I've heard people say that analgesics are all highly addictive, maybe extrapolating from some of the opioids, but uh, I don't think meloxicam has, has many addictive properties that I'm aware of, but these, these things do persist. Tramadol, there's a massive reliance on tramadol as a, um, an analgesic drug um, in developing countries. The evidence basis, particularly for dogs, is a bit sketchy. We, uh, we think because of the metabolism, it probably isn't as effective in a proportion of the population as, as we would like it to be. So we have to be thinking about other drugs. So things like local anesthetic blocks are massively useful, massively underutilized. Xylazine, fantastic analgesic. We tend to only think about it as a sedative for cows in the UK. So having that wide experience base can be really helpful in thinking of more creative solutions to some of the challenges that you might face overseas. So working overseas can be incredibly clinically challenging, but also potentially very rewarding. You need a solid medical and surgical foundation, I would recommend, communication skills and cultural awareness. And don't forget the small things. So as Romain was saying this morning, it's about the animal's whole experience. We know things like enrichment can modulate the chronic pain perception. You know, even in a very basic situation, you can provide a water bowl, even if it is a cut-off bottom half of a soda bottle. You can provide a bed, even if it's a piece of cardboard. I have been to projects before. I have a postgraduate certificate, for goodness sake. And I have been to projects before where I have spent the entire day looking for cardboard and cutting it up, because that is the only thing I can do to improve the welfare of the animals in that situation. It's a very miserable situation, uh, but the small things can be really important and they can make a difference. Okay, uh, I've got five minutes, is that all right? Okay, so it's not all doom and gloom. So this is me, I came from Bristol as well. I suspect this guy probably has a lot to do with the fact as to why James, Emma and I are all in the room, um, whether we um, want to recognize it or not. This is Professor John Webster. If you've not read any of his books, I would recommend that you do so. Um, <clears throat> so two years of general practice, zoo exotics um, and did a bit of field work overseas as well and then in 2007 I moved to China to work for this organization which is Animals Asia excellent uh, animal welfare charity they work on animal welfare on a whole range of different issues and um, we still do some work with them through the Jean Marchig Center today so just a bit of background um, bear bile farming is a legal industry in China and Korea and is illegal but ongoing in Vietnam Bears are kept in small cages about the size of their bodies on farms. Um, in China, it's estimated that there's up to 10,000 bears on farms, and there can be several thousand bears on an individual farm. And they're, they're farmed uh, because their bile is extracted from their gallbladders and is used in traditional Asian medicine. Um, it has very high levels of an active ingredient called UDCA. If any of you are familiar with destillate, or other UDC preparations are available, uh, then there is good medicinal um, evidence for its use in certain conditions. So it's certainly not um, voodoo in terms of, of the medicinal properties. However, there are alternative pharmaceutical preparations available. So we don't need to harvest bile from bears in order to, uh, to access those drugs. The mechanics of it, uh, the fleshy things are gallbladders. It's where the bile is stored once it is produced by the liver. And basically, um, what happens is that a fistula is made in the abdomen of the bear, 
the gallbladder is pulled ventrally and sutured to the abdominal wall. And then you've got a continuous outflow of bile from that gallbladder to the outside world. Obviously, the body tries to heal that. So you can implant metal or latex catheters into the fistula to make sure that you've got a continuous flow of bile. And that bile is worth weight for weight more than gold in the, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Welfare implications. It's not very comfortable. Um, this is a normal bare gallbladder on the left and uh, a fairly representative gallbladder from a, a, a bile farm fair on the right. I've probably done cholecystectomies on, I can't even remember, probably nearly 100 uh, bears by now. Um, and um, this is a fairly kind of representative um, image of a, of a gallbladder. You can see the difference between the, the farmed and the non-farmed um, gallbladders. So we get chronic cholecystitis, we get abscess formation, we get cholaliths. Uh, there's a whole range of hepatic inflammatory um, processes that occur. We get um, lots of um, liver tumors and gallbladder tumors, uh, peritonitis, loads of problems. In addition to all of the other problems that we see from farmed bears, so things like teeth being knocked out, um, animals with ocular disease because of nutritional uh, compromise, general emaciation, animals snared from the wild, so you can see the snare mark on the paw, uh, general skin disease, and cubs being trafficked from the wild to fuel the trade. So there are multiple conservation and welfare issues associated with the production of um, bears for bile. So with that background, just going to show you a video of them, um, ah, which might... Pause that for a second. So this was made by a, a Chinese film crew I, when I lived in China. This is the last rescue I was involved in, which was in 2010. Rescue of 10 bears from a farm to Animals Asia's uh, Rescue and Rehabilitation Center, which is used as an educational facility in China to um, raise awareness of the welfare issues surrounding the bear bile trade. Um, at this point, I've been working for Animals Asia for nearly four years. It's a very experienced. I've done nearly 100 cholecystectomies. I uh, had a great team working with me. Um, and had you know, done multiple rescues from farms. But even so, this was a hugely challenging rescue for me. And um, I think it just kind of hopefully shows you that in terms of animal welfare, societal support is really important, public support is really important. Even things where we think that perhaps people don't care about animals very much, hopefully this gives you a flavor that people are just as individual overseas as they are here, and that lots of people do care but that having good outcomes does really rely on that preparation and knowing what you're dealing with. I don't know if we'll get sound. Mm. Okay, that's not a disaster if we don't. There are subtitles. So this is the last bear farm in Shandong province. Nope. Okay, it's fine. So these are some, excuse me, <clears throat> some of the guys that I used to work with. We had ten bars on this, ten bears, sorry, on this farm. We had to get them all out in a day. <laughs> the building was actually collapsing around us as uh, we were moving them out because it was actually the bears' cages that were holding the roof up. So we had to manage to get the bears out of the cages by breaking the cages open, but without the building collapsing on us. So that was a logistical challenge. That's me when I was a lot younger. Um, every bear was anesthetized. They all had an initial health check. And then they were loaded to larger cages on the back of trucks. And we drove them across China. It's quite a big place. And if anyone knows Chinese geography, Shandong to Sichuan, it's quite a long way. Um, so we had a convoy of two trucks and then a bus where I spent three days without showering. That was nice. Uh, the bears were medicated. They needed analgesics because they hadn't moved for a long time. For some of them, up to 25, 30 years, they'd been on the farm. Um, so we analgesed them, obviously fed them, uh, and monitored them the whole way. One of the bears, a brown bear that was probably the most elderly bear we were dealing with, um, didn't eat the whole time that we were there. And then when we were just outside Beijing, we got stuck in the longest traffic jam in Chinese history. It lasted for over 24 hours. There were no toilet facilities on that motorway. 
I'm going to leave that to your imagination, wasn't very nice. Oliver, who was our, lo uh, our oldest bear, um, hadn't eaten the whole time and was getting worse. Increased respiratory rates, showing signs of abdominal discomfort. We anesthetized him, ultrasound scanned him. We were concerned about peritonitis from his fistula because the farmers had interfered with that. Our amazing Chinese team got the local traffic police involved and we were moved out of the traffic jam. We had an awesome team of veterinary nurses and so everything that we needed was on that truck. Everything was ready and um, they do have TV in China, um, but this was really interesting. So when we got the truck in the car park, we had, I think, nearly 200 people rocked up from the local community just to come and, and watch us doing surgery. So this is a cholecystectomy on an endangered brown bear with a film crew on the back of a truck <laughs> um, and also a, a, a gastropexy uh, with a film crew on the back of a truck um, with basically no facilities apart from what we had. You can't do things like that unless you've got a good foundation of skills. You can't be useful unless you've got a good foundation of skills. So uh, that's not the kind of experience you would necessarily get into as a new graduate, but it is the kind of thing where you can make a significant difference um, if you do have the skills and expertise to be able to uh, deliver something. So and it would be perfectly reasonable as an ethical question within that situation to ask, why didn't you just euthanize him? That's fair enough. Um, the reason was many and varied. Uh, a, we had a good evidence basis that bears, as an incredibly stoic species, recover very well despite years of, um, I guess, physiological deprivation on farms. It's probably to do with their hibernation physiology. That's my interpretation. Um, they do have very unique physiology. They do recover very well. Um, also, from, a, I guess, a, an, an organizational point of view, when you turn up to rescue animals, if you then start immediately euthanizing them, that's a bit of a challenge. You, you, again, you need to be seen to be giving them a chance. How justifiable that is is, is debatable, but it is a real, a real thing that we need to consider, your ethical obligation to the organization that you work for. Um, and previous experience. Previous experience, previous teams. Uh, having done nearly 100 cholecystectomies, knowing that I could do that surgery almost blindfolded, even in the situations that, that we were in, knowing I had a great team around me that I could rely on, uh, and knowing that this animal was going to a place where it had a good chance of rehabilitation were all really important. So, international work, is it worth it? I'm almost done. Uh, yes, because you get to work with loads of cool animals, you get to work with loads of amazing people, uh, you get to meet lots of interesting animals. So from a personal satisfaction point of view, you get awards sometimes if people nominate you. Um, it's very rewarding. Uh, you get to work with amazing people. Um, yeah, I know. Vet nurses are brilliant. I've got friends and colleagues all over the world that are like family because of the type of work that I've had the good fortune to do. Um, and that, I think, is probably the thing that battles my compassion, fatigue, and animal welfare, is knowing that there are amazing people out there doing amazing things. This is me when I was a lot younger. And uh, the other thing that I think keeps me going is knowing that you can make an individual difference to individual animals. You might see those dogs outside in the car park shortly. Um, they're my two dogs, one's from China, one's from Thailand. And you won't change the world by saving an animal, but you will change that animal's world. And I think that we can all do that. Thank you. And that is the bear from the truck that had the coli. He lived for four more years and was eventually euthanized on animal welfare grounds, but actually had four years of a very good quality of life. So 